Today I want to talk to you about habits. <clears throat> Good habits, bad habits. How many wives would say your husbands have bad habits? They leave the toilet seat up. Uh-oh, women. That's one thing you don't do in my house. You better not leave the toilet seat up. Set it back down because if my wife gets up in the night and wants to use the restroom, she don't want to sit in the toilet. She wants to be able to sit down in the toilet. That, that's a crude way of starting. I didn't mean that. It's kind of, we come from such an anointed moment and pastor talks about toilet seats. Can you believe it? Oh, but habits, we all have habits, good habits, and they're a part of our lifestyle, whether we like it or not. We, we've got good habits that I pray that most of us operate in, and then I pray that we, if we got bad habits, we'll find a way to do away with them and change them. And let God, the Spirit of God, transform us into what He wants, okay? And so we want to talk about some habits, not all habits, but there's several habits that we're going to try to touch on today. Symbolic of a healthy lifestyle. How many believe you have a healthy life? You have a healthy lifestyle. Well, I'm going to read some scripture. And habits, uh, the, the word habit is simply interpreted a settled or regular tendency or practice, especially one that is hard to give up. An acquired behavior pattern regularly followed until it has become almost involuntary. A lifestyle, okay? A habit, good habits, should give us a good quality of life, amen? Bad habits can affect you for the negative. And we're going to try to talk about and distinguish some things. If you go in the, in the back of your bulletin, you'll have a scripture there that says, Third John... John was writing to us, and you'll find there uh, chapter 1, verse 2 of 3 John. It says this, I pray that all is well with you. This is a New Living Translation. I pray that all is well with you and that your body is as healthy as I know your soul is. John makes a faith statement here. He's trying to declare to us, he said, I got to believe that your soul is healthy. And if your soul is healthy, then you'll be healthy physically as well. Now, let me ask you this. How healthy are you? Come on. How healthy are you? How healthy are you physically? And how healthy is your soul today? How healthy is your spirit today with God? We want to look at that. I'm going to go to the book of Proverbs, the third chapter. We have another scripture there. And I'm just going to read it to you. Don't, and this is a new, again, another new CV translation. So if you are in an NCV translation, if you would, just let me read it, is this. Do not depend on your own wisdom. Repeat, uh, I'm sorry, respect the Lord and refuse to do wrong. Then your body will be healthy and your bones will be strong. Again, depend not on your own wisdom. Respect the Lord and refuse to do wrong. We're going to see that in the life of Daniel today. Refuse to do wrong. Then your body will be healthy and your bones will be strong. Father, please help me with my thoughts today to be clear, concise, to where you want me to go. God, I, I pray, Lord, that you'd help us with uh, some uh, new insight as to what your word might say to us about good habits, good habits, bad habits, Lord, and how we can correct the bad habits and, and work with by faith and, and resolve in a lifestyle that's pleasing to you. God, we pray that now in the name of Jesus. Amen. I got to think about habits in my own life, and I have so many of them that I don't, I don't realize they're even there because, again, habits become a lifestyle. Habits become a lifestyle, and, and when you come across anybody, whether they're Christian or non-Christian, doesn't matter what background, doesn't matter what country, doesn't matter what race, doesn't matter anything, every one of us get caught up in a lifestyle of habits. We do things habitually. Uh, you'll find some habits are harder to break, the drug habits and the alcohol and the nicotine habits and all these things that can affect you physically and spiritually, okay? Because what happens in the physical sometimes has a tremendous effect on the spirit of a man. And then, of course, what happens in the spirit of a man has a tremendous effect on, again, the habits or the lifestyle of an individual. Good, bad habits, they're there, whether you like it or not. And, and you can come point out all mine, and, and that's what this uh, message is really not all about, but I've got some. And so if you point them out to me, help me find a way. The only way to fix them is God's Word, amen? 
The only way to fix them is God's word. And so we're not here to point out bad habits to a husband or wife or brother or sister or anything like that. What we're here to do is find out what are our habits, why do we have them, and what can we do to fix them if they're not godly habits, amen, if they're not healthy habits. Today we want to talk about five habits of a healthy lifestyle. And we're going to talk about a guy named Daniel today first. The first thought in in your bulletin, on the back of your bulletin for your notes there, you find healthy people eat healthy foods. You're saying, Pastor, come on. Is that how deep you're going to go today? Well, just hang with me a little bit here. Healthy people eat healthy food. Now, we look at the life of Daniel. The Bible says in Daniel, the first chapter, verse 5 there, it says, at the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. Now, what we see here in Scripture, if you were to read this, Daniel and his companions were caught up at a young age. They were in their teenage years. Now, the cool thing is the church that they were a part of or the group of family that they were a part of were strong Christian people. They raised these boys to be with good habits, to take on good lifestyles, to be impregnated literally in their thinking and in their spirit and in their heart especially with the word of God. Daniel was established, even though he was a kid, maybe 16, 17 year old, he was already established like what we should be as mature adults in Christ Jesus. He was established in the scripture. He knew well what he believed, why he believed it, and and he made it a lifestyle, okay? Now, what happens is, it's quite interesting, is why is it that In scripture, we see that Daniel wasn't intimidated by the teaching of the king, nor was he intimidated by the naming that the king would give him, but he was aggravated and intimidated and frustrated and refused the food of the king. So eat good foods. Is it just about diet here? Was it all about what Daniel ate that day was just about diet? No, it was about what he had committed his way to. It was the word that he had been taught that these things would defile him. Now, here's here's what many believe that, you know, the reason why he didn't want to eat the food is because that food might have been already offered up to idols, other gods. We really don't have concrete evidence of that. Teaching, there's no place in historical documents that we can find that's why he refused it, okay? And and you're you're thinking, well, I, I would refuse food, I mean, I would refuse bad teaching over, in my opinion, I would think in natural logical thinking here, I'd refuse bad teaching and bad doctrine and, and bad things like that more than i refuse, you know, a fatty hamburger or, a, or, a, uh, or something that's maybe not the best for my body, okay, because God is more concerned about what? The spirit of a man than he is the body because the body will come in compliance to the spirit of God within the man if by, and God's going to redeem all three. Don't get me wrong. He, he wants at the end of time redeem all three. So what was, what was the reason why he was refusing to eat the king's meat? Well, think about this. And here's, you know, in all my studies throughout the years, I still keep coming back to this one inevitable reasoning. Because it wasn't going to change his heart. Okay. But, it, you know, the, the teaching would not change his heart. The, the renaming of who I am, you can call me whatever you want. You can call me all kinds of names. Sticks and bones may hurt me, but names will never. Uh, sticks and stones may hurt me, but names will never. Okay, we know that it can affect you emotionally. Don't get me wrong. But in Daniel's case, he was already established. He knew who he was in God. But he also knew that his physical man was important to God as well because it was the dwelling place. Now we have and understand it is the dwelling place. At that time, it was just to honor God in good health. I'm going to take care of what God has given me. Okay. So Daniel didn't want to defy himself because he knew if he took it in, it would defile his physical man. It would defile the physical temple of the man, the body. Okay. But he knew that if he took in, now here's the, here's the powerful thing. If you take in all kinds of teaching, okay, it can defile it if you're not established in God. But if you're rooted and grounded and established in God, it's not going to shake you. What it's going to do is it's going to cause you to win Nebuchadnezzar's heart. <laughs> it's going to cause you to win the men and women of that nation to the kingdom of God. Because you'll see that later on, Nebuchadnezzar himself is the one that has to ultimately uh, declare that the God of Daniel, (laughs) 
The God of Daniel. Now, Daniel wasn't changed by his teaching. Daniel was able to change the kingdom by his teaching. But see, if he had took in the physical, it would have represented that he was defiling what God had honored him not to defile according to the word. Okay? So, we need to understand, here's a good example. I was asked Wednesday night. For those that aren't coming with that, you're missing a lot of good things. But somebody asked me about other teachings from other churches, and one in particular was the Jehovah Witness. If you're a Jehovah Witness, have background with Jehovah Witness, please don't be offended by it, but there's some mistruths about what you guys are being taught, okay? And one of the big things, I've always done this when I have Jehovah Witness. I don't refrain them from coming to my home. If they come knock on my home, I'll invite them in. Because I'm not intimidated by the fact that they're going to change my mind about the gospel that I know. In my relationship with Christ, I am assured of who I am in Christ. And I'm not intimidated. I might not all know all the answers and I might not all have all the understanding yet. But one thing I'm assured of is I have a personal relationship in Christ. And it doesn't matter who comes and teaches me. It's not going to change my opinion about who I am in Christ. And I'm established. Daniel was established. He wasn't offended. So the good food was nothing more than good health for him to be able to serve God in a better fashion. The clear of mind and strength. And, but in, in Jehovah's Witness, one thing you'll, you'll find and do this, and there's so many other things that I can tell you about it, but one thing is salvation. They don't believe that Jesus Christ is God. They believe he was a God. And they teach that he who was a, 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 a God that could do many things and many miracles, but they don't believe him as part of the Trinity. In fact, they don't believe in Trinity. That's why they call themselves Jehovah Witnesses, because Jehovah only, Jehovah God only, okay? And there's a lot of distortions about their teaching. Here's what's happening to Daniel. He's brought into something like this. He's brought into something that's going to challenge the very core of who he is, and it's the heart that is what's keeping him strong. Okay, and he's not allowing himself to defile the physical temple because he wants to keep himself strong in every aspect. He don't want to go against the word. So, again, always take him there. Uh, One thing you'll find is they don't believe in the Holy Trinity. Okay, they won't teach salvation by Christ. They they teach it by works. Okay, that's why they're out working so hard to make, they don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. There's all kinds of doctrinal standings that we understand our truth that make the difference, okay? And you say, well, why do they believe it? Because they had somebody that altered the word and, and convinced them to believe this man's inspired writing is parallel or is the same authority that the word of God is. And he'll even say, it's stated in their bylaws and constitution, whatever you want to say of how they bring it, they, their, their doctrinal beliefs is that you need to believe my writings equal with God. And if you dis claim these writings of mine, then you've disclaimed the truth of God's word. And you can never, and he actually says in one part, because I was reading it the other day, trying to refresh my mind, they actually say in one part that he declares that if you read only the Bible, you're missing the truth. Now, the Bible says very clearly not to add to or take away from Scripture. So these are just, the, what I'm saying to you is you're going to have a bunch of people knocking at your door every year of your life, every day of your life. Whether it be your physical door or whether it be at the door of, at work and you're in conversation with them, it should not rock your boat. Know who you are in Christ. Know that Jesus Christ is Lord of your life and know that you're in Christ and all things are possible. You might not all know all the answers, but don't allow them to detour it. What's happening in our college students, and this is troubling me right now because we got a bunch of high school kids graduating. Do they know who they are in Christ? Mom and dad, do they know who they are in Christ? Those that come without moms and dads and they come here on their own, do they know who they are in Christ? Are we giving them enough so when they get into college, some smooth-talking instructor is going to try to talk them out of their relationship with Jesus Christ? And see, this is the important part of being rooted and grounded and creating good habits. Good habits are healthy food is number one, I understand, but that's not the only thing. The the reason why I brought this healthy food part out is to bring out the healthy heart part more than the healthy food. Let's look at the next thought. Thinking good thoughts. Number two there, think healthy thoughts. People that are healthy think healthy thoughts. Listen to this here in Luke 11, chapter verse 34. Your eyes are the lamp of the body. So if your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if the vision is bad, your body will be full of darkness. I I was thinking about uh, the scripture talks about uh, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And there's so many fallacies about 
who's doing the killing and destroying. Today we got God judging for things that he, he's not really judging for. We're blaming God for sicknesses. We're blaming God for deaths. We're blaming God for all kinds of things today. We're blaming God, um, you know, for all the injustice in our world today. Um, you know, somebody was uh, talking to me the other day about why, why, do, why do we have all these injustices in our world today? If there's a loving God out there that loves us so much, why do we have all these injustices? And, of course, that's not just a simple answer. There's, a, there's, a, there's quite a bit of time that you're going to have to take with that individual. And that's all right. I, I invite them, please come. Let me explain to you why I see the Word of God, what the Word of God declares to us, why the struggle is. I want to get you something, something simpler to hang on to. God is good all the time. God is good all the time. I don't know what's happening in your life individually, but God is good to you all the time. Even when you're in sin, God is good to you. God loves you so much that it's beyond measure that he gave his son, not just himself, but he gave him son and himself to renew a relationship with you. God is good all the time, and anything good that ever comes is from God. The devil's bad all the time. There's never a time when you're going to see the devil compromise his badness to you. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy. If you can get just these simple truths, you'll be able to distinguish what is from God and what isn't from God. Just simply by knowing everything good is from God. Everything bad is from the devil. Now you say, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I know bad can come from people as well, but ultimately it stems to the Antichrist, the devil, the, the, the one that's contrary to God, and God is the one that always brings good. Now, there is a lot of different conversation we can have in the midst of all that. But if you can just get that simple truth, sometimes that simple truth will keep you out of a lot of problems. Keep you from blaming the wrong entity. You don't need to blame God when you're in the midst of a storm. You need to be clinging to him. You need to keep your eyes fixed on him. You don't need to be mad at God. Hey, and I've been there. I'm, I'm going to say to you, I fought with feelings too. And I fought with my emotions thinking God was just, just chastised me to the point where I, everything was so out of control. And some of it was God's chastisement. I'm not saying there are during times when God can spank you, but he spanks you with the word. He spanks you with conviction of the heart. He spanks you. He don't spank you with cancer. He don't spank you with all these devastating things. He is, that, that's not good and that's not from God. Okay, I, you know, he don't spank you with all these indifferences. Okay, and the, and the Bible even clearly says this, this child that was born with problems. Whose sin is it, mom or dad's? Or was it grandma and grandpa's? Whose sin was it? Just know that the wages of sin has brought forth all these complications within our lives. Okay, but God said it's for my glory. Stop, don't, don't ever stop seeing it's for God's glory. Even if you've got complications in life that you can't explain, maybe they're health, maybe they're financial, maybe they're all kinds of emotional issues or whatever, I'm telling you, there are going to be times when you can't explain everything, but just remember, God is good. And if you're going to have help and find help through it, don't push away the only one that can fix your problem. Even if you don't have faith, if someday your pastor, Pastor Donald, ever dies of some dreaded disease, just know that God is good, and I don't believe it's from God, and I don't believe that it, it, it was failure on God's part to provide for me because his blood is sufficient. Today, when we come to this table and we partake of the blood of Christ, that blood is sufficient to fix every negative problem and every circumstance in my life if I will learn to trust it like Daniel did. And if an Old Testament believer could say, hey, I'm not going to take in those things that would defile me, but I'm going to live on to God and I'm going to make sure my heart is right. Above all, and if they kill my body, so be it. In the name of Jesus, I'll live on. I'm telling you, church, we get so caught up and we begin to blame God and we get frustrated with God. We become so depressed and discouraged. It's not God that's bringing bad to you. It could be your own evil heart. It could be other circumstances and everything. But God is good all the time. The devil is bad all the time. You can never make a deal with him. He's never going to compromise for you. Nor will God. <laughs> and I'm telling you, God is more able than the devil. By far. And I'm glad I'm on the winning side. So, health thing here. Healthy thoughts. Well, thinking healthy thoughts are important. 
Proverbs says, let's go to Proverbs 4 chapter. Here it is. And this is, the, this is what Daniel had set in him. He said, my child, pay attention to what I say. Listen carefully to my words. Don't lose sight of them. Let them penetrate deep into your heart. See, Daniel knew that he couldn't control. If he put the food in his mouth, he couldn't control what it would do to his body. Because after he put it in, it's there. But Daniel could control what came into his ears. Daniel could control what he saw. I'm going to control it according to God's word. I'm, I don't care what I see and what I hear and what I'm being taught right now. I know that's not God's word. I know that's not what God said to me. I know that's not God's promises to me. I know that's not what the blood can or can't do. I know the blood of Christ. It's a sufficient blood. It's all, it covers all my sins and covers all my diseases and covers all my infrailties of impoverished thinking today. And so I set my heart. Daniel set his heart. He didn't just set his physical body, but he set his heart on the word of God. And that's what we must do. For they bring life to those who find them and healing to those in, in, in your whole body. Guard your heart above all else. For it determines the course of your life. Your heart. Don't let your heart sin against God. Don't, don't, don't really, and please hear my heart here. I, I still joke about it because it is somewhat funny to me, but it's not. The older I get, the realization of how much I know what it is to be healthy. Okay, the older I get, I know what it is to carry extra weight that I shouldn't be carrying. Okay, and I'm not here to talk to you about your diet. I'm really not. I'm here to talk to you about a habit and habits of life that are healthy or not healthy for you. And every aspect, and of course, I know the Bible says in the New Testament that bodily exercise profiteth little. It does have profit there, okay? Healthy diets have profit there. But the greatest profit is the word, recorded word of God and knowing who you are in Christ. Being established strong and well in the word of God. He says, be careful, the, the phrase John uh, Bevere says, be careful and control what you think because your thoughts rule your mind and your mind governs your life. I thought that was a powerful thought. John Bevere wrote that. He said, be careful and control your thinking because your thoughts rule your mind and your mind rule or govern your life. So, you know, I understand if Daniel wasn't established, it would have been easy to persuade that young man to do something else. But the reason why the book of Daniel was written and recorded for you and I is to help you understand to set your heart, not just your physical being, because your physical being needs to be re regenerated. It's going to die someday. Brother Mark is at the hospital right now, and, and I, I believe with all my heart that he wants to live on in this life and he wants to be well. But he's not afraid of death either. And he's lived a good life and he's preached a good word and he'll continue to preach it with, he said, he's, I'm, I'm preaching it with my life, Pastor. I'm not going to stop believing. Though sickness take me, I'm not going to stop believing that by his stripes I am healed. Okay, church, and set your heart there. I don't know if you can always control everything that happens in the physical. But I know what you can control your heart and your mind. And don't allow the circumstances of life, all the stories of the Bible, you're going to find when Peter walked down water, where was his focus? On Jesus. And every time he focused on Jesus, everything was all right. The moment he took his focus off Jesus, everything began to fall apart. The reality is that's true in everybody's life. Everybody, every story in this word is recorded and is centered around Jesus and God the Father and the Holy Spirit working in your life and through your life. And it's about a relationship. God didn't just do all this to get you back to a place called heaven. He said, I want to get you a place of relationship with me. I want to walk in the cool of the day with you. I want to walk in the deepest darkness night with you. I want to be there in the good times and the bad times. I want to know that I'm your God and you know that I'm your God. I want you to understand me with clarity that I am is not just by feelings but it's by faith okay by faith I know by faith so you know whether we win in the physical or not all the time it might not always be but I'll tell you what I'm going to keep getting back up in the word 
until I have no more breath in this body to breathe, I'm going to keep getting back up in the Word. And I'm going to keep declaring the Word to my body, my soul, and my spirit. And I'm going to live like God called me to live. And that's what He's called us to. The, the third thought this morning is healthy people manage their energy. Healthy people manage, what do you mean by manage my energy? You, you manage your life. What are you doing? In life, how many, how many wasted hours and time? Here's, here's poor management, sitting in front of the TV all day long and vegetating. I'm sorry, that's poor management. For a Christian, that's poor management. Unless you're filling it with God's Word because you need time in God's Word. But if it's just there to vegetate cowboys and Indians and cool things like that, you know, I'm a, I'm a Western fanatic. I used to love watching cowboys and Indian movies. Man, I just, I wanted to be a cowboy when I was a kid, okay? But the whole point is, we vegetate. You know, managing your time. What are, we, are, are we managing our time well for the glory of God? Are we honoring God with our time and our talents and everything about us? Come on, how much time do we spend for the kingdom of God? And how much time do we spend for this life? And in comparison, you can only tell. I can't tell you what you're doing for God. And I, you, you don't really even know what I do for God, even though I'm your pastor. Am I in the church just sitting around doing nothing? Or am I visiting? What, what am I doing all day long? What are you doing all day long? What is it in correlation to kingdom business? How are you managing your energy? How are you managing your time? It's important. Psalm says to us here, he says, It is senseless for you to work so hard from early morning until late at night and fearing you will starve to death for God wants his loved ones to get their proper rest. That's the book of Psalms where he said, get your proper rest. Rest in him. Now, proper rest is more than just a physical laying down. It is a resting in him. Get your proper rest. Understand who you are in Christ. Second Timothy, or I'm sorry, 1 Timothy 4, 7, and 8. Keep yourself in training for a godly life. Keep yourself in training for a godly life. Physical exercise is good for your body, but spiritual exercise is valuable to every, in every way because it's not only helping you in the present life, but it's preparing you for the life yet to come. It's talking about kingdom business. You know, again, physical exercise in King James Version it says it profiteth you little. What are, we, what are we spending our time with and how are we spending our energy? Is it all about this life? Come on, think about it. I'm, I'm, I'm a guy that loves building things, creating things. I, I, I just enjoy it. It's, it's a part of me. But in reference to what I'm doing for kingdom business, how valuable really is that? I love piddling with cars. I'm not real good at it. If I get stuck, I'll go see Brother David. He's good at it. He knows how to build a car better than I do, by far. I love building that. But in correlation to what we do, there's nothing wrong with him being a mechanic. Nothing wrong with me being a builder. Nothing wrong with you being a doctor or a lawyer. Nothing wrong with being whatever you are in this natural world. But how much of that is just so caught up that we lose sight of the fact that the real reason why I'm born again and saved and living for Jesus is to build his kingdom. To do kingdom business. And you can do it as a mechanic, a lawyer. You can do it as a builder. You can, build, you can do kingdom business everywhere. Amen. So how much are you organizing your time, your energy? How much of it is being used for kingdom business? We're giving you opportunity in weeks to come be out on the street with us. I don't know who's going to show up there. I don't know if there'll be 10 people from the neighborhood or 1,000 from that neighborhood. I don't know how many people live there. I know there's three, over 300 homes there represented. And I know there could be a big influx of people. What are we going to do to attach them and connect them to the kingdom? Not just our church, but to the kingdom of God. What are we going to do? How are we going to represent? How are we going to utilize our energies and efforts that night to represent God on the street? To complete strangers. Most of them probably will be complete strangers. Never met them for the first time I'm meeting them. How are we going to, are we going to push them so hard that we repel them? Or are we going to find a way to connect with them to bring them in? You know, just because a Jehovah's Witness comes or a Mormon comes to your door don't mean you got to shut the door because you don't want to talk to them. Why are you intimidated by them? That might be good energy there. That might be a time. Now, there'll come a time after four or five visits, I finally say, look, we're bumping heads here. 
I'm obviously not going to convince you that Jesus Christ, you need Jesus Christ to be Lord of your life. And I'm obviously not going to be convinced of your teaching as well. So maybe we ought to just part ways. You go your way, I go mine, and we'll all be happy. There will come those times. But why do we repel certain entities out of fear? Don't you know who you are? Don't you know that Jesus Christ lives in your heart and life? Don't know he loves you? And he put that individual in your past so you could minister to them. They came to your door just to be ministered to. Don't you realize that? They're going to come to your workplace just to be ministered to. You're going to go to them just to be ministered to. Begin to see it. Expending my energy for the cause of Christ. Ordering my footsteps. Let the Spirit of God do that. Healthy people, number four. Healthy people. I originally put enlist support of friends, but I will say to you, healthy people have support of friends. What's that mean? It's important that you gather around people that help build you up in your relationship with God. Some of you know what I'm talking about because you spend a lot of time with me personally, and my whole goal is to be with you, not just to have good fellowship at lunch and eat good food, even though it can be a part of it sometimes. Most of it's always about the Word of God. How can I pour in the Word of God, and how can I receive the Word of God from you? I'm not the only one that needs to do all the pouring. Ecclesiastes, the fourth chapter, verse 9 and 10, two people are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. I, these are modern translations I'm using. I wanted to make it as simple for you to understand. If one person falls, the other can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Have you ever felt alone? <laughs> the, the advertisement on TV, they want you to get this little gadget and hang around your elderly mother or dad because they fall, they can't get up. They'll have help by just simply, hey, I've fallen and I can't get up. We know that phrase real well. We as used to kids used to tease about it. Hey, I'm falling and I can't get up. You know, but the truth of it is, somebody alone like that, it could be detriment to them. Now think of that in the spiritual realm. I've fallen, and I don't know how to get up. I don't know how to fix this in my life. That's why brothers and sisters are so important. Here's another push for why church. Connecting with one another strengthens one another. The final thought this morning, healthy people depend on God. Healthy people depend on God. The Amplified Version said in Luke, the 17th chapter, verse 9, Jesus said to the sick man, get up and get going. Your faith restored you to health. Now notice this. Spiritual restored to physical. The spiritual restored to physical. It always does. The physical will always dominate if you'll let it. If you'll see it as what God said. If you'll get up in it, get up in it. Three factors to consider, and we'll close with this. Greater motivation. 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, verse 31. Whatsoever you eat, drink, or whatsoever you do, you do it all for the glory of God. Greater motivation. Do it for the glory of God. Live your life. Let the habits that you create in life be habits that are pleasing, that will bring glory to God. Greater reward. 1 Corinthians 9, chapter, verse 25. All athletes are disciplined in their training. They do it to win a prize that will fade away, but we do it for an eternal prize. Okay? We do it for an eternal prize. It's eternity that we're dealing with here. That's why as a pastor, if you ever want to feel a heavy weight, just realize what you're doing has eternal consequences, not just physical, not just temporal. What I'm doing right here at the pulpit right now has eternal value. It could break or make somebody's eternal life. That's why I never take it lightly. That's why everything we do here, we try to present ourselves in the best quality we can because every little thing can be an distraction that's dealing with eternal merchandise. Right now, everybody in these pews are eternal. Everything about you is eternal. This building's not eternal, it's temporal. It's just here as a vehicle, a, 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 a tool to use for the glory of God. But you're eternal. And what we're going to do on the streets in the next couple of weeks is eternal. There's eternal business going on there. We're going to have a lot of temporal things happening, but it's all about the eternal business. 
What are we going to do to win them? What are we going to do to grow this church? The final thought, greater power, Philippians, the second chapter, or yeah, second chapter, verse 13. God is now working in you. God is now working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Paul said, God is working in you to give you the power to do what pleases him. What pleases God? What pleases God? That you create habits in your life of a lifestyle that pleases. Faith pleases God. Trust in man's word, no matter what the outcome is.